achieved. Welcome back to Kamikaze Overdrive MMA Predictions. As always, I am your host, Scott Johnson, and on this episode of the show, we're taking a look at the World Series of Fighting 1, our Lossky vs. Cole main card, which will take place on November 3rd, 2012, from the Planet Hollywood Resort and Casino in Las Vegas, Nevada. I'll be breaking down the five main card fights available on my website will be the breakdown for the six preliminary matchups. Now, before we get into the actual predictions, I will be doing a bet pack for this event, and it'll be the discount price, $7, so you're saving 3 bucks. And I really think when you get events like this, there's a lot of potential to make some money because the some of these fighters, obviously we got guys like Andre Arlovsky and Anthony Johnson, Miguel Torres are very familiar with North American you know, betting sites, but there's a lot of other guys in this card that maybe they're not as familiar with, and as a result, there can be some discrepancies in the odds based on actually the chances of fighters winning, and I think we can exploit those. So make sure you consider buying my bet pack for 7 bucks. It's discounted. And again, coming off of UFC 153, I did not have a great night. I went 6-6 six and six overall. Four of my five uh, confidence picks did hit, but in the end, it just wasn't a good night. I had a couple, you know, positives, but really, I was disappointed with my performance. And uh, it's the first time in a while I've had a bad one, and I'm looking to rebound with this event. I really think I have a great opportunity to get things going again uh, before we get back into the long stretch of UFC events. And I'm hoping, the plan is, I will be doing uh, prediction shows for all the World Series of Fighting events. I'm looking forward to this. And one thing, you look at this card, and they've got guys like Anthony Johnson and, and Gregor Gracie, Gerald Harris, Josh Berkman, you know, David Branch. they got a lot of good-name fighters on this card. Jay-Z Cavacante, another one. I would have really liked to see in Strike Force had the UFC not decided to drag it down. Go after and sign these guys. Give them some depth. And it would have been a fantastic... It really would have added to the show. And, of course, on, while we're talking about Strike Force briefly, they were supposed to be putting a card together on November 3rd as well. On this evening, it's been canceled. Two Strike Force events canceled in a row. They're saying they're going to come back in January with the card. Possibly talking about an entire main event, a main card made up of... T championship fights. Either way, I really hope Strike Force sticks around. I do like, I know it's still run by Zufa, but I do like that alternative. If they don't, we're going to see the big names go to the UFC. I'll be interested to see who the UFC doesn't absorb, because I would assume with the World Series fight of fighting kicking off and Bellator going to spike, the UFC is not going to allow anybody like a KJ Nunes or a t uh, Tim Kennedy you know, jump ship and go to one of these other organizations and help give them a little more depth in their rosters. Uh, before I get into my predictions, thank you very much to all of my sponsors, MMABettingOdds.com, HeartAndGlory.com, CouchFighter.co, MMACrips.com, the boys over the Adrenaline Training Center. Make sure you head over to KamikazeOverdrive.net, get the breakdowns. I also did an article, wrote an article myself called, refer, called MMA Purgatory, where I look at a number of UFC fighters who are currently, guys like John Fitch, who currently are one of the best fighters in the division, but because of their past history, are unable, or at least a long shot at getting another title shot, unless things change. So please go check it out. I've talked with a lot of guys. Some guys that escaped MMA purgatory. Some guys that are on the verge of going into it. Some guys are still currently there. So please check that out. Also, I posted a new poll on the website asking of the potential super fights that I posted. Which ones you'd like to see the most? Go and check it out. There's what clear favor right now, but please get your opinion in. And that's enough for me. I think it's time to get into our first prediction. Our first fight of the evening is in the light heavyweight division. It was originally scheduled to be on the preliminary card, which will be shown on ShareDog.com, but instead it's been promoted to the main card, which will be available on NBC Sports. And it will feature the MMA debut of Tyrone Spong, a big-time elite-level kickboxing fighter with a 68-6-1 kickboxing record with one no contest. And he'll be taking on Travis Bartlett, who comes in with a 7-2 and two record overall. Now, first thing, a couple things to look at with this fight. Bartlett, he's been out of action for, I think, over two years. So that's certainly something to consider. And, of course, as I said, it's the debut of Spong, so we'll see him in action for the first time. Now, Tyrone Spong, a lot of people have been waiting to see him get in here. He's a member of the Black Zillions camp, so he's working with some big-time guys there, like Anthony Johnson, like Rashad Evans. So, first question with him is, we know what he can do on the feet. It's his ground game. If Bartlett can get this fight to the ground, can he take advantage of Spong? Spong's made some claims that he's able to hold his own in the gyms, but training in the gym versus training actually in the cage, or fighting in the cage, two entirely different things. Spong's kickbox, kickbox, yeah, kickboxing is fantastic. He has a very brutal liver shot and body shot. He does a nice job, obviously, with his kicks, a nice straight kick. He's got some, you know, big-time kickboxing wins. He beat Ray Seffo, Peter Aitz. He took out Melvin Manuf. He did lose to Alistair Overeem in a matchup where she rocked Overeem early and had him in trouble. And one thing to consider here, he's fighting at light heavyweight in his career as a kickboxer. He fought as a very undersized heavyweight, so it should be interesting to see how he fares here and how his power translates against guys more his size. 
I do expect him to unload with his kicks, his low kicks. We might see him focus more on the hands and using those body shots to avoid giving Bartlett an opportunity to take it to the ground. Now, the question with Travis Bartlett is, will he take it to the ground? He comes in with five wins by knockout. And I haven't seen a lot of him. His lone big name fight, he lost by submission to Tom Lawler very early in his career. And from what I've seen, he's, he has power, he has stopped guys in the past, and he's generally speaking, he's willing to stand and trade. But the thing is, when you put some, somebody like his opponent here in front of him, you know, will that change as soon as the first strike lands? It'll be very interesting to see. Either way, Bartlett being out of the cage for two years, Tyrone Spong coming out of such a high-level MMA camp like the Black Zillions and all the guys he's training with there, I'm going to go with that. So my prediction is Tyrone Spong to defeat Travis Bartlett by knockout. Our next prediction is in the welterweight division as Gregor Gracie comes in with a record of 7-2-0, battling Canadian 9-1 Tyson Steele. Gracie's coming off a three-fight stint in one fighting championships where he went 2-1, while Tyson Mann is currently riding a three-fight winning streak, recovering from his only career defeat. Looking at Gracie over his career, it's, he's a BJJ black belt. It's not hard to see. Of a seven wins, six have come by submission, with one more by decision, which was his debut fight in 1FC. Tyson Mann, on the other hand, nine fights in his career, seven of which, uh, with, or sorry, nine wins in his career, seven of which have come by submission. He also was a knockout and a decision on his card. The lone loss of his career coming by way of submission. Now, looking at this fight, a lot of people talk about the possibility of two strong grapplers getting into a sloppy kickboxing match. I don't expect that here. I really anticipate this fight going to the ground. Both guys are, you know, they don't make any bones about it. They're, they will stand and trade, but when it comes right down to it, their focus is getting a hold of their opponent, putting him on the back. Tyson Steele has a very nice single leg takedown, and he does a nice job controlling his opponent. Manage stays right on him, very tight, and is a, you know does a good job of setting up his submission opportunities. Gregor Grace, on the other hand, excellent timing on his takedowns will work very hard to shoot under his opponent's strikes or lock up a body lock along the cage, use some trips, put him on the mat. Now, one thing I really like about Gregor Gracie, this is something you'll see from a high-level uh, grappler like he is, he does a nice job of slicing through his opponent's guard. But that's not the only thing he's doing. While he's doing that, he's setting up a arm triangle choke. And the, and the issue there is the opponent is not expecting that. The opponent's focused on maintaining control with his guard and keeping his legs tied up. And when Gracie's free and moves in him out, all of a sudden that arm triangle is already set up and it's very hard to defend from that point. So that's something to keep aware of and watch. If Gracie gets on top, he will certainly look for that opportunity. Now, Tyson Steele, his loan loss came by submission, and it was an issue where he was having success with his grappling. I think he got a little overconfident. He stuck his head in while looking for a takedown, and he has a tendency to do that, sticking, you know, burying his head in his opponent's midsection, and it set up eventually, left him vulnerable to being triangled, and that's what happened. He got caught, and he got submitted. And that's what he'll need to be careful against Gregor Gracie. You cannot afford to allow, you know, to give Gracie opportunities to, to tap you out, or it will be over very, very quickly. And that's what I, you know, what I'm looking for here. Another thing with Tyson Steele, on the feet, he has a stiff body kick. And Gregor Gracie, excellent at grabbing that kick and looking for takedowns. And I expect to see something here if Tyson Steele does opt to uh, try and slam a kick into his body. Now, Gracie's last loss against Adam Kayum, he had, he had success early with his striking, or with his grappling, won the first round. But he started to, to slow down. Kayum took over the fight. And even though Gracie was still able to get takedowns in that fight, he wasn't able to do damage from the top position, and that was a major issue. And Kayum got the nod in the last two rounds for a unanimous decision victory. What I expect here, I think this might fight was tailor-made for Gregor Gracie in the sense that he's facing a guy who's not a high-level striker, who is a kicker, who is a grappler, who will oblige him in the ground game. That's what I expect to see from Tyson Steele here. If Steele can keep it standing, Gracie does have some power in his hands, even though striking is fairly basic. Either way, I don't anticipate this fight spending a lot of time standing. I look for Gracie to shoot for a takedown or be more than willing for Steele to take him down and then try and set up his ground game off his back. Uh, when it comes right down to it, I just think that Gracie has the better the grappling skills, so my prediction is Gregor Gracie to defeat Tyson Steele by submission. We return to the, the light heavyweight division as Anthony Rumble Johnson, 13-4-0, takes on 13-3-0 DJ Linderman. Now, Anthony Johnson, well known as a UFC fighter. He has since won three consecutive fights since leaving the UFC, defeating David Branch in Titan Fighting Championships, also following up with a TKO win over Estevez Jones in the same organization. And then his last fight at the Extreme Fight Night 9, he knocked out Jake Rochalt. Now, on the other hand, DJ Linderman comes into this fight. He's also on a three-fight winning streak, and he has some big fight experience. He has fought in Bellator and had success there winning the quarterfinals of their light heavyweight tournament. Uh, he's also fought some other big-time names. He's fought Devin Cole and actually defeated Devin Cole by submission. He followed it up with another decision loss against Cole. He's fought Richard Hale. He's got, you know, he's, he's far from an experienced fighter, and that's something to keep in mind here. Looking at how they win their fights... 
Linderman comes in fairly well, rounded four wins by knockout, five wins by submission, five wins by decision. Anthony Johnson, on the other hand, nine wins by knockout. He's never submitted anybody in four wins by decision. The biggest knock on Johnson so far in the loss category. Anyway, he's been tapped out three times. And, of course, we know Anthony Johnson. We know his story. He fought at welterweight. He tried to go to middleweight when he's, the weight cut started becoming an issue and couldn't do it. He's now fighting at late heavyweight. How will the weight cut and conditioning affect him? Will he be able to fight a full three rounds if required? That's a big issue coming into a fight like this. But he has shown in his, in his last three appearances that he can certainly do it uh, against Estevez Jones. In his last two appearances against Estevez Jones and Jake Rochelle. Against David Branch, that fight was supposed to be middleweight. He was unable to come in and had to fight that matchup at 195 pounds. So keep that in mind when we're looking at this fight. Now, Linderman, as I said, has some big fight experience. He's fought in Bellator and certainly won their quarterfinal matchup in the in the light heavyweight tournament, the guy's fought as heavy as or as big as heavyweight. So certainly he's fought bigger men before. Uh, coming is how these guys match up physically. Both guys about six foot two is the same height, but Johnson's going to have a five inch reach advantage, which I think will will show up huge. Uh, I really like Anthony Johnson. He showed a variety of kicks in his last couple fights and over his career. He has a nice push kick or a straight kick. He throws big head kicks, heavy leg kicks. He throws with a lot of power, and that's something to keep in mind here, especially when he has a reach advantage. If he's able to use those kicks to even further lengthen that reach advantage, it's going to keep DJ Linderman out of range and make it very difficult for him to hit Johnson. Now, Linderman does have an amateur boxing background with an 11-0-1 record as an amateur boxer, so he certainly has some skills there. I think he's a little bit flat-footed for my like, which will, for my liking, which will create create an issue against Johnson, who bounces around, and I expect him to pepper away with those kicks. Another thing with DJ Linderman, he holds his hands a little bit low, and again against Rumble, you got to be very careful with his power because he can explode at any point in time and put a hurting on you. And we saw that against Jake Rochelle. he just kept landing at will, and the power and the the impact of his shots were starting to pile up on Rochelle and eventually it was just too much for him to overcome and he crumpled as a result. Now I have seen DJ Linderman use a heavy grappling based attack. He did it again against uh, in his last fight against Dale Mitchell where he at Legacy Fighting where he was able to get on top and really grind him out and eventually score the TKO win. And that's something that he could potentially use against Anthony Johnson if Johnson gets tired. But I really struggle to see him being able to take Johnson down. What I look for more is Anthony Johnson to control the distance with his kicks you know, keep Linderman out of range, bounce around. I think Johnson should have a slight speed advantage here. And then eventually, when Johnson sees the openings, he's going to push Linderman into the cage, bully him around there, take him down, beat him up. And my prediction here is Anthony Rumble Johnson to defeat DJ Linderman by TKO. In our co-main event of the evening, we are in the Bantamweight division as former WEC Bantamweight champion 45-0 Miguel Angel Torres takes on 8-4-1 Marlon Morace. Miguel Torres comes into this fight off a brutal UFC 145 knockout loss to Michael McDonald. As a and now, following that, he was cut by the UFC. I think that was actually due to some out-of-cage situations, not actually his in-cage performance, because he had won three or four prior to that appearance. Marlon Morace, not well-known on the big stage. But he has won two in a row prior to that. He had dropped back-to-back -back fights. And it will be very interesting to see what the betting odds are in this fight, seeing as Miguel Torres so well-known. And Marlon, certainly not a guy that people are aware of. Looking at how they win their fights, Miguel Torres, a very dangerous BJJ black belt. Of his 40 career wins, 23 have come by submission. He also has nine wins by knockout and eight wins by decision, so he shows he can do it all in his career. Morais, on the other hand, on the other hand, comes in eight wins, three by knockout, three by submission, two by decision. He is a BJJ brown belt, so more than capable of holding his own on the mat. And he's also a Brazilian Muay Thai champion with an overall record in Muay Thai of 25 and five. So keep that in mind. Even though Torres has a significant edge in uh, MMA experience, uh, Morais. Far from a from a novice when it comes to combat fight experience, and he has a, you know a lot of experience as far as that is concerned. The guy trains with Edson Barboza, so he's definitely fighting with some elite level guys in the gym, and we'll see how that translates here. Now on the other side of things, Morais' four losses: two by knockout, two by submission. He has been stopped four times. He is relatively young, so keep that in mind. Only 24 years of age, so he's still working to improve his overall strike uh, fighting game. His uh, first professional fight came back in 2007, and he certainly, uh, you know, seems to be getting things going. He's fought once April 2012, re-picked up a win by knockout in only 47 seconds over Jared Card, which was very impressive. That's available on YouTube. Check that fight out. Miguel Torres, on the other hand, his losses, two by knockout, one by submission, two by decision. We know what his is issues with being knocked out is. He got knocked out with Michael McDonald, which was brutal. He dropped his WEC title to Brian Bowles via knockout, and the following fight, he lost to Joseph Benavides by submission, where Benavides badly hurt him on the feet and eventually tapped him out on the ground. So the big question coming into this fight is, 
A, is Miguel Torres' ability to take a punch officially gone? Can he not take a hard shot directly to the chin? Is that gone? Secondly, how will he respond mentally? And that's a big issue. Coming off his Brian Bulls knockout loss, he did not look like the same fighter, and Benavidez exploited it and stopped him in that matchup with WEC 47 and submitted him. Faraz Zahabi took Miguel Torres, rebuilt him, had to really, he talked about all the things he had to clean up, had to work on him, had to you know, basically turn him into a new fighter. And against Charlie Valencia, Antonio Van Wills, and Nick Pace, we saw that he's not nearly as exciting as a fighter as he used to be, but he was effective using his reach, not taking chances, and not allowing his opponent to get inside. Now he's coming off a Michael McDonald knockout, which was far more brutal than the Brian Bulls knockout. He left Torres crumpled in the middle of the cage, landing a big uppercut. And I'm curious to see how he responds in this fight. Because, you know, he'd been rebuilt, Sahabi had gone over and, you know, developed a style that, you know, suited him better, and he still got knocked out, eventually. Not, not right away, but he eventually got knocked out. I'm curious to see how that goes. Melvin Moraes, on the other hand, the guy has significant, significant power. As I said, you know, he does, uh, he's got that huge Muay Thai striking background. He throws a variety of kicks. He will throw a spinning back kick. He has nice punch kick combinations, and he's very fast. And one thing to keep in mind here is that physically Miguel Torres will have advantages that will help him dictate the range. Three inches of height and ten inches of reach. But first, Torres fights very hunched over, which takes away that height. And, you know, Marlon Moraes has fought the most of his career at featherweight, now dropping down to bantamweight for the second time. So he's fought bigger guys. Having fought Muay Thai, you have to expect he's fought guys with, significant, uh, with reach advantages and knows how to deal with that. And I expect him to use those kicks to help narrow that down. If Moraes keeps his fight standing, it's going to be a very interesting matchup. On the ground, Miguel Torres should have the advantage, black belt versus brown belt, overall experience in those two fights. I give Torres a significant advantage, but keep this in mind. Torres has only completed zero takedowns, only completed zero, in his 12 WEC UFC appearances. He's only attempted five. He usually relies on this opponents to take the fight to the ground, and from there looks for sweeps and submission opportunities to set up his grappling. And that's what I don't expect Moraes to do. I don't expect him to, to, to you know, create openings by taking Torres down. Keep it fighting, use his speed, use his footwork to get inside. And Torres, like I said, mentally, there's going to be some issues there. Against Michael Jump McDonald, when McDonald was able to land some shots against him, Torres went from using that left, long left out in front to keep the distance. He pulled both hands back. He was hesitant, backing straight up. There's openings in his guard. He was getting tagged, and McDonald dropped him and hurt him with a huge uppercut. And Moraes has had some success with an uppercut again in that last fight. He fought against, uh, in his last fight against Jared Card, he used a series of combinations, including an uppercut that put him away. So maybe check that fight out. I really like what Moraes brings with his striking, with his speed, with his head movement. I think Miguel Torres will come in as a heavy favorite, but I actually like what Miguel, you know, Miguel Moraes, sorry, Marlon Moraes offers. So my prediction is Marlon Moraes to defeat in an upset Miguel Torres by knockout. In the main event of the evening, we are in the heavyweight division. It's 17-9-0. Andre Pitbull Arlovsky battles 29-1. Devin Cole, both guys former Strike Force fighters, never met in that organization. We'll hook it up here. Arlovsky is coming off a no contest at the one at one FC in August of 2012 against Tim Sylvia, fight that he should have won with the head kicks, but obviously they called it no contest. Prior to that, he had picked up back-to-back -back wins, both by knockout over Travis Fulton and Ray Lopez. On the other hand, Devin Cole. He has won two in a row wins over Sean Jordan and Gabriel Salinas Jones in his final two appearances in Strike Force, but he has not fought since late 2011, so he's been out of action for almost 10 months, which is something to keep in mind. Looking at their win totals, Andre Arlovsky comes in 13 wins by knockout, three by submission, one by decision. Devin Cole, on the other hand, 10 wins by knockout, three by submission, seven wins by decision. Now, Andre Arlovsky. The big red flag over his career, nine losses, seven of which by knockout. And we, he had that ridiculous run where he was knocked out by Fedor Emelianenko, knocked out by Brett Rogers, and then after fighting Antonio Silva to a decision loss, was knocked out by Sergei Heratanov. So Andre Arlovsky's chin, big time issue. Can Devin Cole exploit that? It'll be very interesting to see if he is able to get inside. Devin Cole, the guy, you know, he's not the most well-known fighter. We know he certainly, you know, strike force appearances. He's fought some big name guys. He's obviously Sean. He took on Sean Jordan and picked up a win there before Sean Jordan was any, you know, had moved on. He fought Daniel Cormier when Cormier was still coming up the rankings. Lost that fight. He's also had experience taking on guys like Rafael Fazio, where he was knocked out. Fought Ben Rothwell and also got knocked out. Lost via submission to Christoph Sosinski. You know the guy's been around decision uh, loss to Jeff Munson. He did knock out Mike Kyle, who has a tendency to go up and fight at heavyweight. But either way, Devin Cole certainly a capable fighter. It should be interesting to see how these guys match up. You've got Devin Cole as an All-American wrestler and certainly has shown the ability to take guys down and control them on the mat. Against Daniel Cormier, he struggled there with the speed in Cormier's wrestling. 
And, uh, you know, when Cormier was able to defend this, the grappling of Cole, it really forced Cole to rely on his striking, which isn't, you know, it's he's capable, but it's certainly not his most, the strongest aspect of his fight game. Andre Arlovsky, on the other hand, fan, you know, very good boxing skills offensively. Good leg kicks. He's very fast for a heavyweight, former UFC heavyweight champion. Very skilled there, but again... His chin is a major issue, and when your chin doesn't hold up, it takes away from your ability to execute your offensive game plan because you're afraid of being countered or leaving openings. Also on the ground, Andre Olofsky again, only three wins by submission, but he's a world-class Sambo competitor. He's very good on the mat, and he, we, we, I saw that against uh, Ray Lopez in his Pro Elite debut where she won via TKO. He does a nice job using the underhooks, trips, putting his opponent on the ground. He was able to beat up, full, or beat up Lopez and eventually got the stoppage. Now, against Travis Fulton, I was not impressed with Arlovsky's performance. He was very inactive, did not throw a lot. And had it not been for the head kick knock that he scored with one second left in the third round, you know, it could have been interesting to see how that fight goes to the judges because, again, Fulton wasn't doing much either, but Arlovsky certainly was not getting off, getting going with his striking, and that's certainly a concern here because Fulton did have some success controlling Arlovsky with his grappling. And Fulton's an undersized heavyweight. Devin Cole... We'll be able to match Arlovsky size for size. And if he's able to get inside, use the underhooks, put Arlovsky on the cage and beat him up, maybe put Arlovsky on his back, that'll be an advantage for Devin Cole and will certainly neutralize Arlovsky's striking and speed advantage. But take into consideration, at least during his UFC and strike force uh, stint, Arlovsky, an 86% takedown defense rate. So certainly he knows how to defend the takedowns. Uh, I'm very curious to see how this fight plays out again. Arlovsky using, you know, against Tim Sylvia, he looked much more aggressive. But again, Sylvia had power, and he hit, he hit Arlovsky a number of times and had him backing up with his strikes, his straight punches. Uh, but Tim Sylvia, for the most part, was a stationary opponent, and as he slowed down, that's when Arlovsky got, was able to eventually put him away. Devin Cole, I expect him to use some movement, try and use, set, set up his strikes, but most of all, try and establish those other underhooks, put Arlovsky in the cage and control him there, and maybe look for a takedown. If Cole can get inside and maybe flurry, he's more than capable of stunning Arlovsky and landing a shot on that chin and putting uh, putting an exclamation mark and picking up the biggest win of his career, I would certainly think. But that could be easier said than done. In his fights with Sean Jordan and his fights with Daniel Cormier, he had a lot of issues with speed. He wasn't able to deal with those guys until he started to slow down. He had success in the third round against Cormier, but again, Cormier was very tired. He had success against Sean Jordan when Sean Jordan started to slow down. I don't think Arlovsky will be able to do that. This might be a, a disappointing fight. It might not be overly uh, entertaining. I think Andre will try and use the distance, use his speed, and when it comes right down to it, he will uh, do just enough to win this fight. So I've got Andre Arlovsky to defeat Devin Cole by decision. So those are my predictions for the inaugural uh, World Series of Fighting event featuring Andre Arlovsky and Devin Cole in the main event. Uh, five main card predictions. My six preliminary predicts will be available over at KamikazeOverdrive.net, and the prelims will be you'll be able to watch them on ShareDog.com on the internet. Certainly worth watching. Honey Torres, Brian Cobb hooking it up, Gerald Harris, Josh Berkman, uh, David Branch also in action against Dustin Jacoby, Jay Z Cavalcante taking on T.J. O'Brien. So certainly six very good fights in the prelims. Make sure you watch them. My over Kamikaze Overdrive bet pack seven dollars on the website. You can purchase those. They will be worth, you know, I think there's some opportunities. I know I'm calling one big upset. We'll see how the preliminaries break down. Again, full bet pack, discounted price. Certainly consider investing. I hope to be breaking down uh, World Series of Fighting events in the future. We've got a big run of UFC fights coming up. I'm very much looking forward to them with uh, the next UFC in Macau event featuring... Uh, Rich Franklin and Kung Lee on the horizon next week. So please come back and check that out. As always, thank you very much for listening. Kamikaze Overdrive MMA Predictions.